You're watching Kidco News. Welcome back. And we are back with the Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy. So, Michael, we were discussing inflation, and it does seem that you and Warren Buffett are actually on the same page on that one. He's recently sounded the alarm on growing inflation, saying he is definitely seeing, and I quote, very substantial inflation across his companies. But you clearly don't agree on the best way to hedge against inflation. Buffett was cited by comedian Bill Maher, who's now become a big Bitcoin basher. And Maher dedicated a big chunk of his recent show to criticizing cryptos. It was a 10 minute long tirade. So we spliced a few of the highlights and I want to get your thoughts on them. Let's watch. Maybe this is why Warren Buffett says cryptocurrencies basically have no value and they don't produce anything. What you hope is that somebody else comes along and pays you more money for them later on, but then that that's person's got the problem. In terms of value, zero. <laughs> or as another analyst put it, it's an open Ponzi scheme. It's like having an imaginary best friend who's also a banker. There is something inherently not credible about creating hundreds of billions in virtual wealth with nothing ever actually being accomplished and no actual product made or service rendered. It's like Tinkerbell's light. Its power source is based solely on enough children believing in it. Yamar yeah, certainly not mincing his words. So why is he wrong, Michael? What is the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? beyond the fact that people have ascribed value to it and believe in it. Again, it's, it's the most disruptive technology of our lifetime. And so it's the butt of jokes. Comedians will make fun of it. I imagine that uh, comedians probably made jokes about planes, trains and automobiles in their time. Um, he, he's wrong because um, let's just you could knock them off one at a time. Uh, the greater fool observation. Why is he wrong about that? He's wrong because uh, when the Romans pumped water into a reservoir, um, they didn't put it in the reservoir because they thought a greater fool would pay them more money for the water in the future. They put it in the reservoir because they thought they might need water in the future. Um, when you actually store food in a refrigerator, you don't put it in the refrigerator because you're going to sell it to a greater fool in the future. You put it in the refrigerator because you think you might be hungry in the future. And when you charge your battery, you don't put electricity in a battery because you want to sell it to a greater fool in the future. You put electricity in your battery because you need the power in the future. So he, he doesn't understand that this is really, in essence, storing energy for future use. And, uh, and the idea that you shouldn't store energy for future use is a silly notion, right? And I think there's biblical, biblical stories about, you know, the, the comedian making fun of people that stored up, you know, during times of plenty against the famine. And then seven years of famine come and the people that actually stored the food live and the people that didn't store the food starve to death. So uh, Bill is like making light of storing energy in order to live a, a better life in the future. Uh, people that don't understand energy systems, right? They don't understand reservoirs. They don't understand batteries. They don't understand aqueducts. They don't understand refrigerators, right? They just, you know, they just don't understand. But if he understood it, then he wouldn't make that joke. Well, maybe he'll watch this interview and some of your other uh, interviews and uh, get a better grasp of it. But I get your point, obviously, store a value, a way to store energy. But on the whole topic of energy, he did also go off on how environmentally unfriendly uh, Bitcoin is, was raging on about the massive carbon footprint. I mean, the stats differ. Some say Bitcoin has a carbon footprint comparable to that of New Zealand, that it consumes more electricity than the entire annual energy consumption of the Netherlands. I mean, various different stats from various different sources, according to the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index, Bitcoin mining operations worldwide now use energy at the rate of the same annual domestic electric consumption of the entire nation of Sweden. M Michael, different stats, but they emphasize the fact that there's huge energy consumption here. In this era of sustainability and ESG and Green New Deals, do you see that as a potential issue? 
Well, first of all, I think there's something cruel and tasteless about an entitled rich white male that wants to deprive billions of poor women and children and men in Africa, Asia, and South America of the basic human right of economic self-preservation so he can generate some laughs. Um, and so I think the entire Bitcoin community, they, they just find it to be tasteless uh, what, what he's done and, and elitist. Uh, with regard to the energy, again, I... He's a comedian. He hasn't spent 100 hours studying it. The world generates 160,000 terawatt hours of energy a year. Of that, 50,000 terawatt hours of energy is wasted, like 30%. Of that, 120 terawatt hours is used to run the entire Bitcoin network. To put that in perspective, that's seven and a half basis points of all the energy in the world. The truth of the matter is everything on earth uses more power than a small country. <laughs> uh, Bill Maher uses 10 times, or electricity that, that costs 10 times as much as the electricity used in the Bitcoin network to enrich himself. And he's not, he's not really thinking about it. If you take all the energy used in the Bitcoin network, it amounts to 25 basis points of all the wasted energy. So one quarter of 1% of the wasted energy in the world offers the hope of a decent life to 8 billion people and solves an economic problem. And, uh, and But the, the 25 basis points is, is of the wasted energy because the Bitcoin network is the bitter of last resort for all energy. So if you eliminated Bitcoin from the world and you robbed the billions of people of a decent chance at a decent life, then you wouldn't stop any waste. You're still going to waste 50,000 terawatt hours of energy. So he's, he's focused upon a nothing. If you actually study the Bitcoin network, you'll find that there's about a trillion dollars of assets under management. It's secured by about $2 billion worth of energy a year. Uh, call it 20 basis points. 20 basis points of the, uh, of the energy in the network uh, is the cost to secure it. Now, that, that energy probably costs about two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, that's what's being paid for it, maybe. And in many cases, it is literally discarded energy and there is zero value for it. No one would pay anything for it. So its marginal value of the human race is literally zero. Whereas the marginal cost of consumer energy and industrial energy is nine to 11 or 11 to 13 cents a kilowatt hour. When people are watching Bill Maher on their iPads and their iPhones, they're paying at least 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Plus they pumped it into their lithium ion batteries on their devices, which probably jacked up the cost by a factor of 10. He's got no problem with them watching, getting laughs, right? Wealthy people getting laughs on expensive energy. Meanwhile, people that are destitute in the rest of the world have a chance at a decent life using marginal cast off energy and anybody would deny them that. Right? I, I can always say, giving him the benefit of a doubt, he's a comedian and he's playing this for laughs and his job is to, is to act like a fool. And um, <laughs> if you take uh, economic, political, or technical advice from a fool, what does that make you? All right, well, let's, uh, point taken, but let's separate like the Bill Maher aspect, even though I did use him to get into the conversation. And the conversation is this idea that there is this narrative that it's an environmental threat. Is that something that you see derailing the rise of Bitcoin in any way, shape or form? I don't think so, because I mean, as I pointed out, right, there are 50,000 terawatt hours of wasted energy, and this is, is literally 25 basis points of that. It's, it's, a, it's a nothing. If you're concerned about the environment, you're going to focus in on, on the dirty energy sources, and there's a 100x or a 1,000x bigger target in a lot of other areas. If you look at the energy uh, consumption of the Bitcoin network, one of the characteristics of the proof of work network is that you only mine Bitcoin in a jurisdiction where the energy is, is cast off, stranded or recycled, therefore marginally not value valuable. And you also only mine it in a place where you're politically welcome. 
So no one's going to set up a, a coal power plant in the middle of Central Park, Manhattan and mine Bitcoin because it wouldn't be politically welcome. In fact, in any country where they were to decide that the Bitcoin miners are not welcome because they use energy, the miners are just going to move to a different country. And, and one, of the, one of the powerful characteristics of the Bitcoin network is, is the fact that it is constantly decentralizing to the most uh, politically supportive jurisdiction. It's also decentralizing to the place where energy is the least expensive, probably the cleanest renewable energy, but certainly the least, uh, the least expensive energy anywhere in the world. And um, the other thing that happens is, uh, you know, the miners are constantly securing the network because they're upgrading the technology all the time. And the miners are, because they're capital intensive, they're, they're raising capital from financiers in each of these political jurisdictions all the time. And the combination of those things means that wherever mining's not welcome, it's going to move. And wherever it moves to, it's going to be by definition welcome. And it's going to be very harmonious with the energy grid. So I don't really think that the energy usage of Bitcoin re re represents a threat. I actually okay. think the opposite, which is, which is the energy usage of a proof of work crypto asset network creates seven layers of security to the asset, which are absolutely critical. The first layer of security is, is uh, they co-opt all of the energy producers worldwide to support the network because you can sell energy at about 45 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour to the network. It's the highest value use of energy in the world and anybody can plug into it. So that's very powerful. The second is it co-ops the technology producers. People are producing these SHA-256 ASICs like the S19 miners and that means all of the technology companies are continually building better equipment that's more energy efficient. The third is it co-ops politicians like the governor of Texas. There's no way the governor of Texas would be supporting Bitcoin except for the fact that Bitcoin mines in Texas are creating jobs and bringing tax revenues to Texas, and they're providing massive revenues to Texas energy producers. The fourth is it co-ops Wall Street because Wall Street's financing all of these Bitcoin miners in a big way. And you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of multi-billion dollar entities that are financing them. The, the fifth is it makes the security uh, temporal. It takes 24 to 48 months to actually create a material Bitcoin mining operation. So if you wanted to attack the network, you've got to do it over the course of 36 months without 250 million people figuring out that you're going to do it. And then it also decentralizes it spatially because you can't locate uh, all of the Bitcoin mining in the world in one spot because you can't get enough energy in the one spot. And so you've got a natural spatial decentralization. After you finish with those six things, the seventh layer of security is um, the mining network. You end up with hundreds of miners that have invested billions, if not tens of billions of dollars in creating these security data centers or security nodes, which we call Bitcoin mines. And, um, and they've got so much vested interest in running the network. They've all got the support of their local politicians, their local governments. They're going to uh, defend the network. And um, this is, there are two more dynamics, very important. One, if I had a billion dollars of gold in Manhattan, You'd be relying upon the mayor, uh, the mayor of New York City and the governor of New York and the country of the United States to secure your gold. But if you have a billion dollars of Bitcoin in Manhattan, the security comes from a decentralized set of nodes in other jurisdictions, not even in the U.S. And even if the U.S., the mayor and the governor attacked your money, you end up with someone in Iceland or Finland or China or Iran or Iraq or someplace in, the, in some cyberspace you can't even find that's defending your money. And so that's, that's a very, very powerful idea. The last point I'll make is that 20 basis points of energy used to mine uh, to, to actually secure the network, that's exponentially decreasing. What's, what's going on right now is, is the, the revenue and the block rewards in the Bitcoin network are falling every four years. 
So by the year 2035, 99% of the Bitcoin has been mined. And that means that the network starts to run only on transaction fees. The incentive of the network to burn energy will fall almost by an order of magnitude. And the efficiency of the SHA-256 ASICs will increase by an order of magnitude. So what, what you've got is a network that is decentralizing itself and making itself exponentially more efficient. So you could reasonably expect, if we look 20 years out, that probably the cost to secure $100 trillion, well, it might be $50 billion, but that would be five basis points five basis points of the total value on the network, which makes it the least energy intensive, most efficient technology that we have perhaps discovered ever in the history of the human race. All right, a very compelling argument there, Michael. So you're not concerned about this narrative of it not being clean and green and the whole energy consumption aspect. You've ruled that out. You're ruling out the idea that uh, governments and central banks are going to intervene and regulate it in some way that severely impacts it and undermines its uh, flourishing. So what is your outlook for Bitcoin then? Because earlier you told me that you don't see any existential threats to it. So where do you see it going? I think Bitcoin is... is um Again, the dominant digital monetary network. And uh, that means that you can expect first thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of corporations to plug into it. And we should have 250 million people that hold Bitcoin by the end of the year. So I expect a billion people within five years and I expect 5 billion people uh, within a decade or so. I think that there'll be 5 billion people or more with mobile wallets, with uh, digital currency and digital assets, and Bitcoin will become the, uh, the global settlement, and settlement network and the global synchronization network for all of them. Um, what, what Bitcoin does is it allows you to establish a trusted relationship with a counterparty. And that means, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, you know, the secret to a successful relationship is shared values. And that's the truth with two people, and it's the truth with two companies or two countries. So shared values requires a value network. And so Bitcoin is a shared value network. And I can say, for example, that in 20 years of trying, there's no way that my company could do business in Nigeria. There's no company, there's no way that a bank in the US can trade easily with a bank in Nigeria or Lebanon or Iraq or between Nigeria or Zimbabwe and Argentina because of the difficulty of establishing trust in, in the fiat monetary system. So when you establish a digital monetary system, you can establish trust of value in 24 hours. And so what I, what I think will happen is I think we're going to see an explosion of billions of people doing tens of billions of transactions on layer twos applications that are all synchronized with the protocol of Bitcoin as the layer one. And I think Bitcoin will just continue to grow as an asset class. It'll be the underlying asset that's used to establish trust across all of these counterparties everywhere in the world in the 21st century. So what does that mean for the price of Bitcoin? What is your projection there? Over time, it will go up. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I got that. How <laughs> high? <laughs> Care to give me some kind of number? Yeah. I, I think that if, if you look at the $500 trillion monetary planet and the $1 trillion you know, crypto asset fire burning in the core, you can expect that that will continue to expand. It's been expanding pretty rapidly. I think it'll continue to expand as it absorbs the monetary energy of the other store of value assets. So it should slurp all of the energy out of, or large portions of the energy out of the precious metals and then out of uh, monetary indexes and, uh, and broad money equity ETFs. And so there's no reason why it shouldn't go from a trillion to 10 trillion to 100 trillion. Uh, over what time frame? I, well, I'm not a trader, so I don't guess by the week, by the month, even by the quarter. I mean, for me, a decade you know, is a target. And I'm expecting that 
this thing will just continue to grow for ever for my lifetime. I don't see any reason why it won't stop growing because it's for the first time in the human race's history and first time in 5,000 years, we figured out how to create digital scarcity on an open network. That's, that's a one-time invention. And the protocol itself is like as profound as English or Arabic numerals. It's like once, once you've got a way to do arithmetic with Arabic numerals, how long will that go? Well, long time, 400 years so far, I guess, in the Western world has been going. So I, I don't know why this won't just continue to grow for hundreds and hundreds of years as a protocol. You mentioned ETFs and you mentioned scarcity. And there we could be seeing Bitcoin's ETFs approved in the US. And there is some argument that with the Bitcoin ETFs, you'll have more Bitcoin derivatives, a bigger Bitcoin's futures market, and that that could ultimately create paper Bitcoin, which could take away from the scarcity of the Bitcoin market. Do you see that happening? I mean, what is your outlook on the impact of potential Bitcoin ETFs and Bitcoin derivatives being approved? I think it's natural that that you're going to see uh, Bitcoin is the solution to everybody's problem. Uh, the big tech companies need an open monetary network uh, to, to build the next generation of products. So like Square Cash, PayPal, eventually Apple, Google, Facebook, they have to build Bitcoin into their mobile wallets because they need this, uh, this universal digital asset on, an, on a protocol, on a global network. Um, all the finance companies, the insurance companies, the fund companies, et cetera, they need to build Bitcoin into their finance products. So if you have a savings account without Bitcoin in it, right, the Bitcoin savings account yields 160% a year for a decade, and, and uh, the other conventional bank savings accounts yield 15 basis points. So it's pretty clear that if you don't have a savings account with Bitcoin built into it, all the assets are going to flow out of your bank. If you're Fidelity or Pemco and you have mutual funds, you're going to build Bitcoin into your funds. The ETF is the plain vanilla. So Fidelity's fi filed for a Bitcoin ETF as I have like eight other entities. But, you know, why wouldn't you build Bitcoin into your bond fund? If you look at the performance of bond funds, they're hideous um, over the last decade and especially over the past year. Um, the real, if you look at all treasury funds, all treasury applications, if you have a monetary inflation rate of 15% to 20% a year, and we have that right now, and if the, if the treasury yield on most of these funds is 1%, 2 3%, you have a negative real yield of 15%. So you've got a negative real yield on all the cash instruments and all the bond funds that is minus 10 to minus 15% or more. So as a matter of preservation, I think that the solution is you put Bitcoin into the bond fund, you put Bitcoin into the mutual fund, you put Bitcoin into the bank, you put Bitcoin into the mobile app. If you're an insurance company, I'm going to sell you life insurance. I'm going to take your premiums. I'm going to invest them in a swap. A 30-year swap yields, let's think about it right now, 220 basis points, maybe. Yeah, 2.2% 2, 2, 2 interest. That's what I'm going to get. Now, if I invested those premiums in something that yielded 20% interest, presumably the cost of your insurance policy goes down by a factor of 10. Well, Bitcoin's been running a lot more than 20%. So what if I told you I can give you a life insurance policy, which costs you 1 20th of your current one? Or what if I told you I'll give you a life insurance policy that pays off 25x more than your current one? Presumably, I'm going to obliterate every life insurance policy, every insurance policy in the world. So the insurance companies are going to, are going to want to build a thermodynamically sound asset, a deflationary appreciating asset into insurance, just like the banks need it. Just like if you're going to lend or securitize against it, you want, you want good liquid collateral. Bitcoin's the best collateral you could imagine. So I don't, I'm not concerned that it's a negative. I think that it's scratching the surface, like uh, the Bitcoin ETF will come along. It's one derivative. There's going to be hundreds of derivatives that will be built on top of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is like base layer, the layer one of the money. And the layer two 
the scalability for the civilization, it won't come from Bitcoin because Bitcoin is gov- it's capped at 350,000 transactions a day. Now, you could say the critics say 350,000 transactions. That's not fast enough to be a currency. Correct. It's not fast enough. Well, if I could move an aircraft carrier every 150 milliseconds for the rest of your life and I could teleport it anywhere on Earth, it'd be fast enough to win a war. If I could move all of Manhattan seven times a second anywhere in the universe, that'd be pretty powerful. So what Bitcoin is, is a settlement network to move blocks of a billion dollars of energy seven times a second between PayPal and Amazon and Google and Facebook and JP Morgan and Fidelity and Zimbabwe and the government of Turkey, right? And the government of Japan and the Bank of China. That's what that is. And it scales because we go from moving 100 million to a billion to 10 billion to 100 billion. If I told you I can move all of San Francisco in 130 milliseconds anywhere in the universe, well, you would think that's pretty cool. But if I said to you, oh, I've only got seven transactions a second, Visa runs fast, you say, well, that's pretty crappy. It's just a question of what you're moving. So when you think about it like that, what you see is the, the settlement network is the granite upon which you build the 21st century economy. The application layer is PayPal and Google and Apple Pay and Amazon Pay and Fidelity and, and, and life, your life insurance policy and the ETF. And, and, and um, maybe, the, maybe it's, it's like the city of New York borrows $10 billion, buys Bitcoin and eliminates taxes forever to the benefit of everybody in New York. That's a derivative. Right. That's right. They could do that. Turkey could go and they could buy five billion dollars of Bitcoin in their central bank treasury. And then that would be worth 50 billion over the next five years. And they could strengthen their currency. And 50 million people in Turkey would, in essence, have a Turkish lira, which is a derivative of Bitcoin. So you're thinking about how does the world scale? Right. How do you how do you scale this thing? Most people, they get it wrong. They think, well, it's got to scale on the base layer. They're just tragically uninformed. We don't need to scale on the base layer. You want to fix your country like Nigeria or Zimbabwe? The way you fix your country is you buy $2 billion, $3 billion worth of Bitcoin and you issue currency back to buy the Bitcoin. That is the Bitcoin standard. And every one of your citizens stops starving to death and they, they, they live a decent life. So I, I think that you're going to see that everywhere, right? And it's a race. Well, you know, who's, who's the kingmaker? Bitcoin's the kingmaker. If, if Facebook adopts Bitcoin before Apple, you know, it's good for Facebook. If Facebook doesn't, it's good for PayPal. If PayPal doesn't, it's good for Square. If Apple does, it's bad for Google, right? So it, there's going to be a battle between big tech. There's going to be a battle between Fidelity and Pemco. Who, which fund company? There's going to be a battle between the insurance companies. Who do you want? The insurance company that, get, that gives you like, what if I just collected $1,000 once and the life policy was free, no premiums for the rest of your life? Wouldn't I want that one, the free one? Right? So, so in every single industry, the way that you win is you adopt a thermodynamically sound monetary network as the underpinning. You're going to build Manhattan, build it on granite. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is granite in cyberspace, right? It's, it's the most stable property in cyberspace. So any country, any city, any company, any individual, any product, any service can be enhanced by plugging it into that network and then relying upon that as the source of energy in order to differentiate in a competitive world. Michael, before I let you go, you said that one of the reasons that you invested in Bitcoin was because 99% of the world disagreed with you and you've positioned yourself as a contrarian investor on a number of different fronts. So what does it mean for your outlook if more and more people do get what you're saying, if they do come around and that does seem to be the trend and you're no longer a contrarian to believe in Bitcoin the way that you do. Does that change the way you view yourself as a contrarian investor? I think that Bitcoin will grow in popularity this decade. This is the decade of Bitcoin and it will spread to billions and billions of people. 
and it'll make the world a better place. It'll bring, you know, economic empowerment to billions of people and brings hope to billions of people. And I'll be happy to fade into the woodwork and be forgotten when that happens. It won't bother me at all. Well, I highly doubt you'll be fading into the background, but either way, you've laid the groundwork of positioning Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset and in getting companies to view it as such. Elon Musk uh, may owe you a thanks, but Michael, thank you again for sharing your thoughts on Kitco News. Thanks for having me, Michelle. And thank you for watching. Keep it here on Kitco News for more. <laughs>